We are still in chapter 1. I was just sharing with uh, Brother Martin, I believe. Just, uh, First Timothy is a very, very emotional uh, letter. As we mentioned, it is the last letter the Apostle Paul is writing to his dear son, his spiritual son, Timothy. And you can almost see the emotions that he's going through as he is suffering in a Roman prison and being prepared, preparing himself to, to be taken and to be with the Lord. And we find ourselves in 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verses 15 to 18. But to give you a little bit of a background before we read that, we want to uh, go ahead and start with uh, verse 3. So let's go look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, and we'll read all the way down to verse 18. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 says, I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you, even as I recall your tears, so that I may be filled with joy. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm sure that it is in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord of, um, or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason, I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. You are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turn away from me among whom are uh, Phygelius and Hermogenes, the Lord grant to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me, the Lord granting him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well what services he rendered at Ephesus. So we see here now, we're focusing on verses 15 to 18, as Paul is encouraging Timothy not to be ashamed of the gospel or his prisoner who Paul is at this time, but to be willing to suffer with him, yes, even to die for the sake of the gospel. Let's bow our heads in prayer and ask God to speak to us, that God would give us uh, this encouragement and help us to also stand strong. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, what a blessing it is to, to read this letter in a time of great persecution there in Rome. As Paul himself is awaiting, uh, not only has he had his first defense, but now he's awaiting his sentence. And uh, Lord, uh, what a man of, of tremendous faith. Lord, he himself has been taken into the third heaven where he was able to uh, spend time in paradise and to hear, water, uh, hear words that we're not able to, to repeat and to see things he's not able to share. And yet, Father, he knows that to live is Christ and to die is gain. He knows it not only through your truth, but he knows it experientially. And so, Father, what a blessing it is to read this final letter as he's penning this to his son Timothy. And Lord, that you would uh, build in us, uh, men and women, that we would be men of courage men of strong conviction, men of faith, men who, who are assured of what we believe in in Christ Jesus as our Savior and Lord. And Father, I just pray that you would help us, that when it comes to standing for Christ, that we would speak the truth and live the truth. 
And we ask that you would bless us now, Father, and, and that, that you would speak to every heart. And I ask for your grace and your mercy on my voice. And this time that we have together, we pray and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So we can see that, that Paul, in chapter 1, there is a... Uh, he has said several times, telling Timothy, Timothy, don't be ashamed. When it comes to standing for Christ, when it comes to standing for the truth, when it comes to standing for your testimony in Christ, and you and I have to understand that we have confessed Christ as our Savior and Lord, and we're not to be ashamed of that, but rather, instead of just words, we're to be living holy and godly lives. And when we speak, our lives are backing up the very gospel that we're preaching. That means we are to live worthy of the gospel of Christ. And so he's telling Timothy, he, uh, who is the pastor right now in Ephesus, and he's combating false teachers and false teaching and doctrines of demons, and he's telling him, look, Timothy, I know it's a lot easier to, um, to uh, go back and to and to shrink back from when it comes to standing for truth, and especially when you have such uh, tremendous and formidable enemies. But he says in verse 7, if you remember, God has not given us a spirit, and the actual word is cowardice. God has not given us a spirit of cowardice, but we're to stand strong in the Lord, willing to suffer for Him. But He has given us a spirit of power and of love and of self-control or discipline, so Paul is encouraging him, and as you remember last time I spoke to you, that Paul himself says to Timothy that when it comes to his faith in Christ, Paul is a man of strong conviction and is convinced and assured of the promises of God in his life, specifically that he will be with the Lord when he leaves this life. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To live is Christ and to die is gain. You have to believe that, beloved, because it's true. And you also have to believe and understand that, that all the suffering you go through in this life, there's a purpose and there's a reason for it. We see that in Romans 8.28, that all things work together for good to those that love God. And so we, we are safe in the hands of our living and loving God. So Paul says these wonderful words that we, we sung this morning. He says, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted to him until that day. That's Paul saying, basically, his faith is completely resting upon the Lord and his promises. And he tells Timothy to continue to retain the standard of sound words, sound doctrine, beloved. He says, which I have, uh, which you have heard from me, being an apostle, sp speaking for the Lord. And then again, he tells Timothy how to do that. Do this with conviction. Do this with faith. Do this with, with passion. Do this with love, which are in Christ Jesus. And then again, as I mentioned last time, he tells Timothy, using the, the, the second person, Aorist, imperative to do this once for all time guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you and that is a true gospel now we find in verses 15 through 18 there's two points I have in your bulletins verses 15 we have uh, the title that I've given this is one not ashamed one not ashamed in verse 15 he talks about the cowards and then verses 16 to 18, the courageous. As you know, Paul was standing trial and he had to stand before Nero. And one of the things that they did and they, when they would bring him before Nero is he, they would have people that would stand with him, maybe people of prominence that would stand as character witnesses. They did that back then. Well, no one stood with him with poor Paul. Um, and I'm sure he asked these these men, if they'd be willing to stand with him. And you see in verse 15, he says, you, telling Timothy, you are aware of the facts because the people that have abandoned him are those from the very place where Ephesus is at, in Asia Minor. You are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia, and of course that's a hyperbole, in other words, 
uh, these prominent men in Asia that Paul thought that were his friends, maybe converts that, that he had shared the gospel and even leaders. You are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia, what happened? They turned away from me, among whom are Phygelius and Hermogenes. And you may wonder, why is Paul mentioning these two men? Because these men were prominent men, possibly leaders there in Asia Minor. And so we learn that Paul mentions these two men, and it's just heart-wrenching. Not only does Paul know them, but, but Timothy himself knows these men. And I think Paul was surprised and even shocked that these men were not willing to stand with him. And the, and the very reason, possibly, is because they were afraid for their lives. As you know, Nero was a maniac. And if you were associated or a leader in Christianity, you would be arrested and even killed. And so they were afraid, and uh, they were not willing to stand with Paul. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. We see that Paul is giving some very personal information to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, Make every effort, he tells Timothy, to come to me soon. He wants to see Timothy before he dies. And he says in verse 10, another sad note, For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. So this man literally has what they call apostated. He knew the truth. He knew what Christ has done for him. But he is willing to give that all up to go back into the world. What does that mean? That means he never knew Christ. It's the same person where Jesus said in Matthew 7, where they say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your presence? And he says, depart from me. Right? I never knew you, you, and listen to this, who practice lawlessness. These people named the name of Christ, but they never truly repented, beloved. You have to understand that the evidence of true conversion, number one, is love for God and repentance from sin. So this person was with Paul, close to Paul, the apostle. He seemed to be doing well, but really in the end, his heart was revealed. He never knew the Lord, and so he left, and he departed and deserted Paul. And so he says, Demas, having loved this present world, as opposed to loving God. He deserted Paul, gone to Thessalonica, um, and he says that, uh, talking about Titus to Dalmatia and, and, and other men who, uh, who are part of his team. Look at verse 11. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark. This is John Mark. And bring him with you. For he is useful to me for service. That means that Paul and John Mark had reconciled. As you remember, there was an argument that he had with Barnabas. This was Barnabas's cousin. And uh, they have reconciled. Look at verse 12. But Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. He's going to be there to replace Timothy. He says, When you come, bring the cloak, which I left at Troas with Carpus, the books, especially the parchment. Paul still wants to study in his last days. While he was on trial, there was a man that stood against him, Alexander the coppersmith, possibly the same Alexander from Ephesus, who would make idols of, of the goddess Diana. And because of Paul's preaching, it hurt, his, it hurt his industry. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. In verse 16, he now talks about his defense, where these men abandoned him. He says, at my first defense, no one supported me. Now, Timothy was busy in Ephesus. He was not one of them, as along with Titus, they were involved in ministry. He was looking for these prominent men in Asia Minor to come with him. Maybe they had stated they would be with him. Maybe he had written them letters. We don't know. But when Paul stood before Nero, they were not there. And I think Paul was very hurt with them. And uh, he says, at my first offense, no one supported me, but all what? deserted me may it not be counted against them but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me 
that through me, listen to this, the proclamation might be fully accomplished. What do you think Paul did when he stood before Nero? When they stood before him and were questioning him whether he was a Christian and why he was a Christian and, and they saw that uh, they believed that Christianity was uh, in opposition to, to Rome as they called Jesus Lord because as you know most people would say Caesar is Lord or Nero is Lord. It was an emperor type of worship. What do you think Paul did? He preached the gospel. That's what he did. He preached the gospel to Nero and those that were there that were, that were judging him. And Paul says, you know, Christ stood with me and I just preached the gospel. Well, when you're dealing with people who are demon filled, it's not going to be the best for you. But you know what? God gave him the strength. That's what he says. Verse 17. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth, at least for now. And you know how it ended up for Paul. And so we see that, that uh, beloved, I want you to understand that even to Paul, to die was an escape. And it is. If you're suffering, to die is to be with the Lord. So we bring, go back with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And you can find that Paul is very hurt with uh, these dear friends that he thought were, were, were close to him. But they were more into um, self-preservation than when it came to standing with Paul. And so Paul says to Timothy, he began to share with Timothy, you know that those who are in Asia Minor, they, they all turned away from me. And then we just saw in, in chapter 4, he says, may the Lord not hurt, hold that against them. But what happens when it's their turn to stand before Nero, to stand before Caesar? I don't think they'll be happy if no one stands with them. So he reminds Timothy that these men, they are just plain cowardice. But you know, it's only a matter of time that they're going to be arrested. And those people in Asia Minor, and Timothy knew them. He, I'm sure he knew them personally. And, uh, and like I said, there were men that were possibly leaders, prominent leaders there in the churches in Asia Minor. And during Paul's first offense, there was no one there for him. Um, go with me to Romans 21. I think we saw this last time, but I want to remind you that when it comes to standing for Christ, or even those who are being persecuted for Christ, we have to make a decision in our mind before it even happens. Are you going to stand for those to stand for Christ? I remember... I'm sorry. Revelation. I started with an R. Reve Revelation 21. <clears throat> My mind's going to be a little cloudy here. Revelation chapter 21. And you remember, I mentioned this, I believe, a, a while back, where we see that the Apostle John is, is sharing this revelation with us about the new heaven and the new earth. This is called the eternal state. And this is what the Apostle John writes for us in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. So God's going to, just like we're going to have a new body, the first heaven, the first earth will pass away because it's been corrupted by sin. Look at verse 2. And I saw what? I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is where? is among men and he will dwell among them and they shall be his people and God himself will be among them. I love sharing this passage with those who lost loved ones. Loved ones that know the Lord because we're going to all be together. It's going to be an awesome reunion, beloved, when we are with the Lord. Look at verse 4. And he, the Lord, will wipe away, what? Every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death. 
There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. This is all the curse of sin, isn't it? The curse of sin will be over when we're with the Lord. No more tears, no more mourning, no more pain, no more death. All these things are going to pass away. For now, we have it with us, don't we? And some of you who lost loved ones, you're hurting. But you know what? The day is going to come where it's going to be all done away with. Verse 5, And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. And Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But look at verse 8. We saw this last time. I want you to understand that, there's, that, that the, the sin of man... The very first thing he mentions, those outside of this beautiful city. He says, but for the cowardly. See that? And what else? The unbelieving, I did a word study on that, and it actually means, um, it actually means the unfaithful. The untrustworthy. That's what it means. The untrustworthy. But for the cowardly and the untrustworthy and abominable, and murderers, and immoral persons, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, their part will be where? Not in heaven, not in the new Jerusalem. Will be in the lake that burns with fire, and brimstone, which is a second death. Scary stuff. Hell is real, isn't it? But so is paradise. And so, beloved, we have to understand that when it comes to being cowardice, this is not something that God blesses. But rather, you and I have to be people who have made up our minds, who trust in the Lord, men and women of strong conviction, who are following God without an apology, doing what is right, saying what is right, living the truth, because we're here to please God, not man. And that's so important. And so when it came to the Apostle Paul, he was surprised that these men were showing cowardice. And he's telling Timothy, watch out, Timothy. You might be tempted to, to cower. You might be tempted to be ashamed of your testimony for Christ and of me. Don't do it, Timothy. But stand strong. Be willing to suffer. Yes, even to die for your faith. I want you to think about this. What are you willing to suffer for? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about what you're willing to suffer for and what you're willing to die for? I mean, you really need to think about that. I think some of us, when we think about that, we think about our families, don't we? We think about our families. Guess what? We're to love the Lord more than our families. You understand that? I love my wife. I love my children. I love my mom. I love my siblings. But we are to love Christ more. And so, beloved... We have to really think about that when the time comes. I remember my wife, we were driving, and I don't know, she was looking at the news or something on her phone, and some man had, uh, had gotten shot. He was protecting his wife. And she turns to me, as you know. She goes, babe, would you take a bullet for me? <laughs> I said, of course, babe, of course. She goes, I knew you would. And so, you really have to think about this because the time is getting darker, isn't it? And uh, we see that Israel's at war right now and, and people are standing against it. Let me tell you, I stand with Israel. Because I believe in the Abrahamic covenant. That those who bless him, God will bless. Those who curse him, God will curse. And that has to do with Israel. But I want you to see that. It's, it's prophecy that all the nations will turn against her. But also against Christians as well. Who will stand with her. And, and so you have to understand that when it comes to, to, uh, to being cowardly and untrustworthy. God does not reward that. He do, does not reward cowardice. The very opposite. He rewards faithfulness. He rewards men and women of conviction and confidence. And assurance. In other words, men and women of faith. 
and we have to trust God even with our last breath. Go with me to um, Hebrews chapter 10. We see that the author of Hebrews is encourage, encouraging these Jewish men who have been suffering for their faith <coughs> not to go back or to shrink back. In Hebrews chapter 10 verse 32 we learn that many of the Pharisees during the time of Christ had come to faith. But you know what? They're paying a price. Some of you know about Nicodemus. He went to Jesus in John chapter 3. He went at night and he says, Lord, we know that you come from God for no man can do these things unless God is with him. And according to church history, Nicodemus became a believer. And he was martyred for his faith. Well, these are the type of men that the book of Hebrews is written to. Men like that who come to faith in Christ. And some of them are, are thinking about going back because the persecution is so heavy. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32, the author, and uh, I don't believe it was Paul. I think Paul was martyred by, by then, but, you know, I could be wrong. But I'm just saying the author writes in verse 32, he says, But remember, he says, the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings. As you know, if you were a Jewish man living in those days, to come to Christ, you were basically ostracized from everything. You would lose your business, maybe even lose your family, even lose everything that you owned because you're outside and put outside of the Jewish community. He says... Verse 33, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations and partly by becoming sharers with those who are so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, the author is writing, do not throw away your confidence. What is their confidence? Christ. Don't throw away your testimony and your confidence and the promises of God because physically it's become very hard for them. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence which has a great reward for you have need to endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. Verse 37. For yet in a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction. But of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. And so I want you to understand that, that uh, many people... When they hear the gospel, as you remember the four soils, remember that? They hear the gospel and as you're living your faith and you're, you're practicing uh, your faith in Christ, what happens is persecution happens. Uh, not so much maybe in a physical way. I remember a young lady I was sharing the gospel with and she was from Persia. Actually, she was Iran Iranian. And as I shared the gospel, she was so happy and she started going to church and then suddenly she... Stop going to church. She stopped taking my phone calls. And I learned later on that her mother and father told her, if you don't, if you don't stop being a Christian, we're not going to have anything to do with you. And because of her parents, because they were ostracizing her, she said, I can't take that. I, I, I'm not going to be a Christian. And you see, you have to understand that we're going to be tested, aren't we? And that happens, doesn't it? I knew of a young, another young lady and... Uh, She's a pastor's wife today, and when she came, when she was at, in college, she was a, a Catholic lady. And, uh, and these young men who were Christians began to share the gospel with her, that her salvation was not based on her works, that her salvation was based on God's grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone. And she remembers thinking, she said, I remember, she called me Brother Daniel, I remember Brother Daniel feeling that all my life I've been deceived. I've been lied to, thinking I can earn my own salvation when it was by God's grace alone, through faith alone. And so she was so happy. She trusted in Christ as her Savior and Lord. And she had this wonderful 
treasure with her and trust it to her and she went home so excited as a college girl and her her sister and her two brothers and her mom and dad were there and she began to share with them that she trusted in Christ as her Savior and Lord and that they also can be saved and her mother says come here I want to speak to you and so they went to the kitchen she just told her I just want you to tell me one thing is Mary still your mother and she says, no, you're my mother. She says, I want you to take all your things out of my house and get out of my house. And it was, it was a serious situation. She no longer can come home because she stood for Christ. And like I told you, she's a pastor's wife today. But she, when she told me the story, she was, she was in tears. And she still prays for her her family, I know her brother came to the Lord and her sister. They're in my Sunday school class because of her witness. But I want you to understand that there's going to be persecution. The Bible says that the enemies are going to be in your own household. Why? Because you belong to the kingdom of light and others to the kingdom of darkness. This is real stuff, isn't it? We had a dear neighbor. We were friends with them and... and uh, they were, they were just uh, so kind to us, and, uh, and we would share the gospel, and, and the woman, she came to faith in Christ. Well, the next thing we knew, that her husband was trying to kill her. It's like, what happened? But that happens, beloved, and it happens in, in the very households of true believers. And, uh, and you have to understand that we're not just talking about persecution on the outside. It begins even with very close family members. So it's not time to be cowardly. It's time to stand for truth. And, and uh, as I said, the Lord is using that young lady that, that, who's a pastor's wife today. What does the Bible say we're to do? First of all, we're to be strong and speak the truth and live the truth. And uh, I'm sure if she had... Uh, told her mother that uh, she hasn't changed, that she would have peace at home, but she had to stand for Christ, didn't she? She had to stand for Christ. The Bible says here, go with me to um, 1 Corinthians 16, that when it comes to standing for the, for the Lord and standing in the truth, Paul says we need to act like men, and ladies act like ladies. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, Paul is giving some final words of exhortation, as he usually does in 2, I'm sorry, yeah, in 1 Corinthians, we'll start in verse 10, he's giving some final words of instruction, he says, in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 10, Now, if Timothy comes, see that he is with you without cause to be afraid, for he is doing the Lord's work as I also am. Verse 11, So let no one despise him, but send him on his way in, in peace, so that he may come to me, for I expect him with the brethren. But concerning Apollos, our brother, I encourage him, I encourage him greatly to come to you with the brethren, but... But uh, it was not at all <coughs> his desire to come now, but he will come when he has opportunity. As you know, Paul surrounded him with a team of men that would go out and minister to the churches, not by himself. And listen to this. One of the final exhortations he gives to the church in Corinth in verse 13. What does he say there? He says, be alert. Alert about what? False teaching, false doctrine, sin, Anything that's displeasing to God, be alert, first of all, in yourself. Be watchful. You know why? Because it's coming. It's coming. There's temptation is coming. False teaching is coming. False doctrine is coming. So he says, be alert. And then he says something very, very wonderful. Stand firm. That's like standing your ground. It's a military word. Stand firm in what? In the faith. Act like men. Be strong. What, are they, what does he mean by being alert and stand firm? It has to do with the gospel message. 
has to do with standing in the truth. Be alert because there's going to be lies. There's going to be sin. You need to be alert of these things and you need to purge those things out. When it comes to the truth, when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to, to purity, you need to stand firm and stand your ground. He says, stand firm in the faith. And then he tells, and, and I'm, sure, I'm sure this uh, is for all these men, but he says, act like men. What does he mean by that? He's saying, be courageous. Be courageous. Be strong. And, and so he's calling them to, to not be cowards. When it comes to being a man of God, there's no room for cowardice. You've got to stand strong in your faith. Convinced of what you believe. And don't compromise. And that's what the Lord is calling us to do. Go with me to Proverbs 20 or 25. Proverbs 25. We are called to be faithful, aren't we? In Proverbs 25, verse 13. We see that Solomon, probably the one that uh, wrote most of Proverbs, and Proverbs 25, look at verse 13 and 14. This is the Proverbs I thought about when these men abandoned Paul. Proverbs 13 and 14, and then we'll jump to verse 19. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 13 says, Like a cold of snow in the time of harvest is what? Is a faithful messenger to those who send him. You know, when you hear good news from far away, it's like, ah, oh, it's... That is so refreshing. That's what Onesiphorus was to Paul. He was refreshing to him. He says, for he refreshes the soul of his masters. Look at verse 14. Like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts in his gifts falsely. A person says he can do all of this and then when you trust him, there's no rain. You know, like clouds without rain. Look at verse 19. I think about these two men that Paul is mentioning. You know what they were? They were like a bad tooth and a foot out of joint. Right? Right when you're really depending, you're going to eat something really good and then you have this bad tooth. You ever bitten down on a bad tooth? That's no fun. Like a bad tooth and an unsteady foot is confidence in a faithless man in time of trouble. Make sure... My friends, that, uh, that uh, when, you, when you trust somebody, that they have character. This is something we're always drumming into our daughters. When you're looking for a man, make sure he's a leader. Make sure he's, he's a man of God, a man of character. Otherwise, you're going to be putting confidence in a bad tooth and an unsteady foot. And when you do that in time of trouble, when you need them the most, they're not going to be there. That's what happened to Paul. Trusting this man would be there and... And I think what probably hurt them the most, if they promised to be there and they were not, wow. So Paul was hurting, wasn't he? He was hurting. And so he tells Timothy, you're aware of all this, that those who are in Asia, they turned away from me. And he mentions these two men. But the wonderful thing is the very opposite. And he has a hard name. Onesiphorus. I mean, all these syllables here. Onesiphorus. Look at it. Go back with me to First, uh, Second Timothy, chapter one. Here's the very opposite, and the reason why Paul is is sharing this with Timothy is he's giving Timothy an example of a faithful, a faithful man who's not ashamed. <clears throat> Look at verses sixteen to eighteen. The Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he was in Rome, and there's a, that's a trek from Asia Minor to Rome, he eagerly searched for me. That means Paul was not in, a, in an obvious place. He was probably put in the back in the dark dungeons of, of Rome. He eagerly searched for me and found me. The Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well what services he rendered at Ephesus. Now what we see again in chapter 4 
is that Paul once again says to greet the family or the household of uh, Onesephorus. Now, some commentators believe that he had passed away. We don't know. Some say that because he's not talking directly to him or greeting him. Others believe that he's been on a trip. I'll tell you what, when I'm with the Lord, I'll let you know, but no one knows. But if he had passed away, it's a, fa it's a very sad commentary, but I think Paul would have mentioned that. But Paul is now remembering this great man, this great man of courage, who is not afraid to be arrested, who is not afraid of suffering, who is not afraid to stand with Paul. And you may wonder, what makes a man stand so close to Paul and to stand with him in his chains and willing to suffer and die with him it is a man that loves Paul. That's the type of man he is. And beloved, this is the type of love God calls us to have. And I think you have that, many of you have that with your family. But God calls us to have this with our church family as well. And this takes time, doesn't it? So Paul wants to point out the example of, to Timothy who needs to follow the example of Onesiphorus. Again, who is willing to, to suffer arrest in ministering to Paul the servant. This man had a sterling reputation, uh, reputation as a faithful and courageous man. And I, I was just thinking about what causes this man to stand with Paul. And I, I always thought about how the parents, as you remember, you, you see the news and you see uh, maybe a young man or a young lady standing trial. And, and the only person that's faithful to them is probably their mother or their parents who love them. And, uh, and, and I see that when it came to Onesiphorus, his love for Paul was so strong that he was compelled by the Holy Spirit to be with him, even willing to suffer with him, and even to die. What a blessing to have a man like that. And yet, that is what God calls us to be when it comes to men and women of God. We have to be men and women of compassion. Go with me to Matthew 25. You guys remember this passage. In Matthew 25, when the Lord begins to judge the nations, you see this in Matthew 25, that there's a big difference between those who know the Lord and those who do not. In Matthew 25, keep your finger in 2 Timothy, verse 31. If you remember, the Lord comes and he is judging the nations. He mentions that. It is believed this takes place after the tribulation. <coughs> Matthew 25, verse 31. He describes those who know the Lord. Those who know the Lord, love the Lord, and love his people. He says, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit at his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. You want to be a, a sheep. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you and from, from the foundation of the world. And then he begins to share their compassion and their character. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even to the least of them, you did it to me. So you see, beloved, when we are serving God's people, or when we show kindness and mercy, you know what this is? This is common grace. Remember where it says in the book of Matthew chapter 5 that the sun shines on the evil and the good and the rain rains on the evil and the good? What is that? That's called common grace. And one of the ways that God extends His common grace are through His people. When you see a person that's hurting and you go and you help somebody, 
or you meet somebody else's need, maybe a complete stranger, what are you doing? You're showing God's common grace. Of course, what they need, more importantly, is the gospel. But God uses us to demonstrate his common grace. And that's exactly what's taking place here. This is the, the heart of true Christians that love the Lord. They show God's common grace. But then there's the opposite, isn't there? Verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in naked and you did not clothe. You did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they themselves also answered, Lord, when did we see you hungry? Oh, if we knew it was you, Lord, we would have done something. Remember Lazarus and the rich man? Where Lazarus and the rich man were both sons of Abraham. And, and the rich man would, would uh, eat like a king every day. And Lazarus would be seated at his gates full of sores. And the dogs would lick the sores on his legs. And he was hoping he could just get a crumb from the man's table. There was no compassion. No compassion. And so they're saying to the Lord, Lord, when did we see a stranger? You know, they're trying to change their tune now. And did not invite you naked and, you, and did not clothe you. Sick and, and in prison and did not visit you. Then they themselves also answered, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And so I want you to see then that, that uh, when it comes to uh, true Christians, we have to show not only courage, but we're men and women of compassion, aren't we? You know why? Because every man, every woman is made in the image of God. That's why the Bible says we're not to curse men. Because we're, they're made in the image of God. And even though they're doing, they do evil, we have to pray for them. So we see then that we are to be kind even to, uh, even to our enemies. Isn't that strange? <coughs> it says if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. Why? You're showing God's uncommon grace. Excuse me, common grace to them. And, and so we see then that, that when it came to Onesiphorus, he loved Paul so much, he was willing to suffer, he was willing to, to stand with them, he was willing to be in chains. Who knows why Paul is mentioning only his family. Maybe he is in jail, we don't know. We just don't know what's going on with him. And, and so we see over and over again what greatness looks like. And what greatness looks like, beloved, it looks like a servant. We see this through the scripture. Matthew 20, go with me there. If you're in Matthew 25, just go back a few books. Matthew 20. <coughs> As you know, the um, <coughs> disciples were always arguing who was greatest. Remind me of junior high kids, you know. Matthew 20, verse 24. But they had to grow up really fast. <clears throat> we learned right before this that James and John got their mama to come and ask Jesus to have one sit on the right hand and the left. And the rest of the disciples didn't think about it and they got really upset with them because they wanted those positions. But they thought it was a sly move, maybe. Look at verse 24. That's not the way the Lord works. Verse 24, and hearing this, it's talking about the, the, the men. The ten became indignant of the two brothers. Thank you, brother. They became indignant of the two brothers. Thank you. Verse 25, but Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the what? The rulers of the Gentile, what do they do? Lord it over them. And their great men exercise authority over them. That's how the world acts. Gentiles can be also translated the nations. They lord it over. The rulers lord it over the people they're over. 
Verse 26. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become what? Great among you? What does greatness look like? Looks like Jesus. Looks like a servant. You want to be great in God's eyes? Be a servant. You want to be a great in God's eyes? Be nobody. Be a slave. Nobody else will recognize it, but God will recognize it. And so he says, you want to be great among you? You shall be your, you shall be your servant. Verse 27. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as, right? The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. What is greatness in God's eyes? Is it someone who has a very high education? I think that's important. That's great. But the one that is servant of all. Because when you serve, specifically when you serve God's people, you're doing it as unto the Lord. That's great in God's eyes. You know what kind of man Onesiphorus was? He was a great, great man. That's who he was. A great, great man serving Paul, even willing to stick out his neck for Paul. He was a man of compassion as well. Isn't that the lesson that Jesus gave when he washed the disciples' feet? Remember that? Remember that time there? They're going to have the very last supper. In John 13, they're going to have the last supper, and they all go in there. And, uh, and as you know, they... Um, they didn't sit down in chairs, but they actually went on like couches. On one, on, they was, they'll be on one elbow, and the other hand, they'll reach for the food. And as they were going towards the table, everybody saw that there was, there was a basin of water, a pitcher and a basin, and, and a towel there to wash their feet. But there was no slave there. Remember that? There was no slave in the upper room. And so the, the, all the disciples saw the basin, saw the pitcher of water, saw the towel. Nobody touched it, right? None of them washed their own feet. And they're not going to wash anybody else's feet. That's what slaves do. And they didn't do that. So they're all at the table. And it says that the Lord Jesus, I believe it was after supper, got up went to that basin, went to that pitcher, took the towel, put it around himself, and he began to wash their feet. Remember that? And when he did that, the room went silent. They're like in unbelief. This is God Almighty in the flesh washing their feet. And when he comes to Peter, remember? Peter's so embarrassed. They're all looking in shock. And Peter says, Lord, do you wash me? You shall never wash me. And Jesus, Jesus said, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. You see, it was symbolic, wasn't it? It was symbolic to his ministry. It is symbolic to Jesus being a servant. It is symbolic of what Christ does for us. For God so loved the world that he gave. Our Lord Jesus, that's his whole ministry. It is the ministry of serving us. Our greatest need was the forgiveness and salvation of God. And that's what Jesus did for us on the cross. So Jesus was now demonstrating his whole ministry in washing their feet and meeting their need. And so Peter, of course, gets carried away. He says, not just my, my feet, but my hands and my head. And Jesus says, no, you don't need to take a bath. But Jesus says, I'm being an example to you. If I, being your teacher, wash your feet, you need to wash each other's feet. What does he mean by that? That means we're to meet each other's needs, right? To serve each other. The greatest among you will be servant of all. Do you want to be great in God's eyes? Be a servant. Don't worry about what other people think. You just be a servant. You want God to exalt you? Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. We don't exalt ourselves. We don't lord it over people. We just become servants. And we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. That's what Jesus did. Galatians 6. Go with me there. We see that in Galatians. 
as Paul is writing to them, he tells them, look, you got to learn to be servants. Galatians 6, verses 7 through 10. Galatians chapter 6. We learn that when we serve God's people, we're serving the Lord. Remember when, when Paul, when Jesus appeared to Saul before his name was Paul? Remember when he appears to him? Basically, Saul fell off his horse or donkey. We don't know what he was riding. The Lord appears to him. And remember, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my church? Is that what he said? What did Jesus say? Why are you persecuting me? Was Saul actually persecuting Christ himself? No, Christ was already, had already gone to heaven. And yet, Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? Because he was persecuting his church. What we do to the church, we're doing to Christ. If we're serving the church, we're serving Christ. If we're persecuting the church, we're persecuting Christ. So, beloved, how much more you and I need to be serving and honoring the Lord and being a servant. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 says, Do not be deceived, Paul says. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. If you sow apple seeds, you're not going to get grapes, right? If you sow iniquity, if you sow, sow something that's fleshly, you're going to get something dark. But if you sow spiritually, God's going to bless you. He now begins to break this down. Verse 8. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Verse 9. Let us not lose heart in doing what? In doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So always do the right thing, right? Always do what's good. You ever wonder, well, what's, what should I do? Here's a, here's a very simple answer. Do the right thing. Or I like that WWJD. What would Jesus do, right? What would Jesus do? Verse 10. So then, Paul writes, while we have opportunity, let us do good to who? To all people. Do they deserve it? No. But we are an extension of God's common grace. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially, underline that word, to those who are of the household of the faith. In other words, to fellow Christians. If you can find where a person has a need, I encourage you to help meet that need. That's how a person feels loved. Do you understand that? That's what love looks like. Have you run into a person that you have a hard time with? They're like a porcupine. They're very hard to love. Find out what their needs are. You know, even an animal, even a dog, as you begin to meet their needs, they begin to appreciate it. Even an animal. How much more a human being will see that? They may not show it, right? There are certain people that are so prideful, they don't show their appreciation. They're just prideful and they just, you know, and you might feel like they're taking advantage of you. You know what? That's okay. You're showing God's common grace. And we still show kindness. We still show love. We are to do good to all people. Even those who don't, don't show appreciation. You know what? You're doing it to the Lord. You're doing it to the Lord. Right? Really important. Let me close with this. Have you, have, you have you thought sincerely about what you believe? Do you have strong convictions that you'd be willing to suffer and die for? Have you thought about that? Have you thought, this is what I would be willing to suffer for if I had to suffer. This is what I'd be willing to die for if I had to die. If I had to lay down my life. I'd be willing to do that. Some men are doing that. Soldiers are doing it today, aren't they? Laying down their lives for, for their country. But we have to really think about our convictions. What we are willing to suffer and die for. Because that's what he's calling Timothy to do. 
Timothy, don't be ashamed of me, but, be, but join me in suffering. Onesiphorus was willing. Let me tell you something. I believe, I can tell you my convictions, I believe that Jesus Christ is God's divine son. I believe he's the second person in the Trinity and that he came to earth, born of a virgin, lived the perfect, holy, sinless life as the God-man. I believe when Jesus was a young man, our Lord Jesus laid down his life as a lamb of God for sinful, ungodly men. That he died a substitutionary death on the cross. That he was buried, but on the third day that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. And now he's at the right hand of the Father. I believe that because that's what the scripture teaches. I also believe that by repenting and trusting in Christ as my Savior, as my Lord, that I am saved and I am forgiven according to God's promises. What about you? What do you believe? Have you thought about that? Have you repented from your sin? Are you trusting solely upon Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you been delivered from the wrath to come? Let me tell you, because it's coming. Someday you will stand before God. And let me tell you, if I stand before God, I'm going to point to my Savior. I'm going to say, Father, the Lord Jesus standing at your right hand, he suffered and bled and died for my sin. I don't deserve heaven. I deserve God's wrath. I deserve hell. But through Christ, I am forgiven. I am saved. Because of what he has done. And, and because of Christ alone, I am saved and forgiven. And I hope that you can, you can make that testimony yourself. Well, let's pray. And I'm going to have Steve come forward. Or Martine. One of them. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your precious word. We thank you for men like um, Onesiphorus who was uh, willing to suffer and to join in the sufferings of Paul and even willing to die. And, and maybe he, he, he had died. We don't know, Lord. But I thank you, Father, for men like that. And, and Lord, I believe that this man was compelled in his faith in you, in his faith in you and his love for Paul that he was compelled by your Holy Spirit to minister to him. And Timothy knew him and knew of this man, knew him firsthand and the type of man he was. I pray that you make us all servants. Lord, give us that type of love. This love is not conjured up. It's not created from ourselves. It is a gift of God. And I pray that you give us this type of heart and love for one another, beginning with our family. And now, Lord, we ask your blessing upon us and I do pray that the food that's been prepared, that you would bless the food and our fellowship together. We pray and we ask all these things and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.